Okay, open your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. We're going to look at verses 1 through 12 today. Remember last time we looked at uh, helping others to stand firm. And we stated that we can and be a helper like Timothy was to this young church. We could share the word with them and teach them. And we can definitely pray for them. And Looking at chapter 4, verses 1 through 12, we're going to be talking about a walk that pleases the Father. And so let's take a look at those verses. Paul says, Finally then, brothers, we ask and urge you in the Lord Jesus that as you receive from us how you ought to walk and to please God just as you are doing, that you should do so more and more. For you know what instructions we gave you through the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality, that each one of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor, not in the passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God, that no one transgress and wrong his brother in this matter, because the Lord is an avenger in all these things as we told you beforehand, and solemnly warn you, for God has not called us for impurity, but in holiness. Therefore, whoever disregards this, disregards not man, but God, who gives his Holy Spirit to you. Now concerning brotherly love, you have no need for anyone to write to you. For you yourselves have been taught by God to love one another. For that indeed is what you are doing to all the brothers throughout Macedonia. But we urge you to do this more and more and to aspire to live quietly, and to mind your own affairs, and to work with your hands as we instructed you, and be dependent on no one. And so in this, Paul talks about the walk, and he, in his letters, especially in Ephesians, he talks a lot about the Christian life um, as a walk. He says in Ephesians 4.1, he says, walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. In Ephesians 4.17, he says, walk not as the Gentiles do. In Ephesians 5.2, he says, walk in love. And in Ephesians 5.8, he says, walk as children of the light. Christian life begins with a step of faith, and then that step leads to a walk of faith. And last week, we talked about uh, helping others to stand firm. And, and we um, talked about, you know, with babies. They have to learn how to stand before they learn how to walk. And now Paul is going on to helping them to learn how to walk uh, in a manner that pleases the Father. Um, and you think about it. Walking suggests making progress. You know, if I'm, if I'm walking, I'm, I'm making progress. I'm going someplace. I'm not going to just stand still and walk, unless I'm exercising. But if I'm walking, it, it, it suggests that I'm making progress, I'm going someplace. And the same is true with our Christian walk. It means that we should be making progress, that we should be growing in our Christian life and in our walk. And so we must be light, like John says, one, um, mainly because the enemy of our to just put traps out there and, and he does do that he puts traps out there to uh, to, to catch us up and be careful and must be or walking at the end of this life we will step into the very presence of God we talked about that taking the long view looking ahead to what's waiting for us and so, in this passage, Paul describes a three-step walk that we are to walk in holiness, says we are to walk in love, and then he says we are to walk in peace. And so, let's again take a look at uh, verses 1 uh, through 8, and we're going to talk about walking in holiness, uh, first of all. He says, finally, now Paul is a, a true preacher, right? I mean, when a true preacher says, finally, you know he's not done yet. 
he continues to go. And Paul continues to go. He's in the fourth chapter here saying finally, but he's not done. He's still got another chapter to go. But he says, finally then, brothers, we ask you and urge you in the Lord Jesus that as you receive from us how you ought to walk and to please God. And so we're talking the Father. Now, um, immorality was that Christianity was brand new there. And, uh, you know, the Christian message of holy living was new. It was new to the culture of these believers. And so they were being taught something that was brand new. And it was not easy for young believers to fight uh, against the temptation. Paul gave four reasons uh, that we should live a holy life in this section. First, he tells us that we should live to please God. Now you think about this. We all live to please somebody. If we're married, we try to please our spouse and try to, you know, uh, make them feel good and try to do what's, what's right and appropriate for them. Um, but unfortunately, people live to please themselves. And they to do when I want to do it, whom, uh, however I want to do it. And, and they just live life that way, pleasing themselves. But Christians cannot go through life only pleasing themselves. Paul says in Romans 15, 1, he says, We with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. We must be looking out for other people. He even talks about that in the book of Philippians, that we are to think about others more highly than we think about ourselves. But we must be careful when it comes to pleasing others. Now, it is possible to please others while we're pleasing God. And we're living in such a way that our life is pleasing to God. But it's also uh, possible to please others so much that it actually dishonors God. And so we have to be careful with that. Pleasing God must be the main motive for our walk, for our life. Uh, you think about this. Children should live to please their father. And as children of uh, the living God, we should live to please our heavenly father. And we need to be careful when we do this. Paul says in Ephesians 6.6, 6, he says, Not by way of eye service as people pleasers, but as bond servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. Not just on the surface level, but from the heart. Do, the, do what's right in the eyes of the Lord uh, from our heart. Well, the question rises, how do we know what pleases God? Well, by reading and studying His Word and by listening to Him and, and living with Him. And so as we read and study His Word, as we fellowship and as we uh, you know, worship in service, we get to know the heart of God. And it opens up the will of God. And so, as we read and study His Word, we get to know what God is all about. Everything, you think about this, everything that we need to know about God, everything that we can know about God, everything that He wants us to know about God is here. Anything that's not here, we don't need to know, and we can't know. He has revealed Himself in His Word to us, and so... We know the will of God by reading the word of God. And so we need to live to please God. Secondly, we need to learn we need to live to obey God. When Paul ministered in this city, he ministered uh, to the believers and he says he gave them the commandments of God. The and, and this in particular regarding personal purity. Look again at verses two and three. He says, For you know what instructions we gave you through the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality. And so he's talking about here specifically personal purity. And these are the instructions that Paul received from the Lord. Remember, he's writing the New Testament. You know, he's, he's living out the New Testament. So the New Testament hadn't been written. He's actually doing that. He's living it out. And so... He's receiving instructions from the Lord and giving, you know, as well as, uh, uh, you know, talking about the Old Testament as well. Paul gave them the Word of God. And uh, 
Uh, John MacArthur says this. He says, God's word contains God's will, both affirmations and prohibitions. He says, God's will includes salvation, 1 Timothy 2, 4, self-sacrifice, Romans 12, 1 and 2, spirit filling, Ephesians 5, 18, submission, 1 Peter 2, 13 through 15, suffering, 1 Peter 3, 17, satisfaction, 1 Thessalonians 5, 18, and settledness, Hebrews 10, 36. And particularly here in this passage, Paul is talking about sanctification, which literally means uh, a state of being set apart from sin to holiness. And so we are to walk a walk in holiness, and we are to walk the walk to, uh, to please God and to obey God. Um, and, and think about this. This is a, a, a touch subject here in, in our world today. But God is uh, very clear as to what he says. Sexual immorality does not please God. We are to be, in, in the context of this passage, set apart unto holiness in sexual purity. And, and you think about this. Um, from the beginning, God has created and established marriage as a sacred uh, union between one man and one woman. Period. No waffling on that. He's very clear about that. We can look at Genesis chapter 2, verses 1 through 25 in the Old Testament. We can look at Genesis chapter 7, verse 2 in the New Testament. And over and over and over again, he gives instructions to the husband about his wife or to the wife about her husband. He's very specific that marriage is about one man and one woman period. And then God created sex both for the continuance of humankind and for the pleasure of the marriage partners. The writer of Hebrews in Hebrews 13 4 says this, let marriage be in honor among all and let the marriage bed be undefiled for God will judge the sexually immoral and adulterous. That's a stern warning. God will judge the sexually immoral and adulterous. You think about it. commandments for sex are not um, to, for the purpose of robbing people from their joy. Just like any of his commandments. They're not for our harm, but they are for our good. And they're actually concerning you know, uh, the purpose of, of, of joy here. Uh, protecting the, the wife and the husband that they may not lose their joy. And so God's purpose, Paul says, is our sanctification, that we live in obedience to Him in purity of mind and body. And so we are to please God, we are to live to obey God, and then thirdly, we are to walk to glorify God. Look at verses 4 and 5 again. He says that each one of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor, not in the passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God. And so we live to glorify God. Christians are be different in the world. We, we talk about this over and over and over again. We're, uh, we're kind of swimming upstream, you know, if you will. We're, we're to look different. We're to sound different. We're to act different. We're to think different than the world. Now, when he talks about the Gentiles, he's, he's talking about the who do not know God, and so therefore, they do not live a godly life. They live actually as Christians. And we have His Word, and we know what He says in His Word, and we are obligated to glorify Him in this world. As a matter of fact, that is the chief end of man, glorify God. And so we are to walk a walk that glorifies God. Jesus said in Matthew Right, He says, let your light shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. We should have a desire to glorify Him and to shine the spotlight on Him. And, and so we're to walk in holiness, to please God, to obey God, to glorify God, and then finally to escape the judgment of God. Look at verses 6 through 8. He says... Um, 
that no one transgress and wrong his brother in this matter, because the Lord is an avenger in all these things, as we told you beforehand and solemnly warned you. For God has not called us for impurity, but in holiness. Therefore, whoever disregards this disregards not man, but God who gives his Holy Spirit uh, to you. So we're to walk in holiness to escape the judgment of God. God is no respecter of persons, right? And therefore, when His children walk in, in, in sin or live in sin, then He must um, chastise them. As a matter of fact, the writer of Hebrews tells us that He chastises those whom He loves. And so God has not called us for impurity, but He's called us for purity, Paul says here. Um, Warren Wearsby, and, and I love this author. The privilege of salvation also involves the responsibilities of obedience. Deuteronomy 7, 6, For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. And so we are to live to glorify God, and we are to live in such a way that we're not, uh, you know, now we're not going to be judged as far as where we're going to spend eternity, because that was taken care of on the cross. Jesus was actually judged in our behalf. The wrath of God was poured out on Him in our behalf. But we will be chastised if we're not living a life that pleases our Father. A holy walk involves a relationship with God the Son who died and a right relationship with God the Son. The presence and the, in, in the indwelling of the Holy Spirit that makes our bodies the temple of the living God. Uh, according to 1 Corinthians 6, 19-20. And so it, it's by walking in the Spirit that we get victory over the lusts of the flesh. Paul talks about this in Galatians 5, 16. He says, walk in the Spirit, and then he says, you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. And so, as Paul talks about here, to despise God's commandments is to invite the judgment or the chastisement for the child of God uh, on your life and also to grieve the Holy Spirit. And so as we yield to the Spirit, He empowers us to walk in holiness and not be detoured into the lust of the world in the flesh. And you think about the world that we live in today. Then think about, oh man, I wish I was younger, I wish I was younger. things that are coming at them. You know, Facebook and the internet and, 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 and it's just, there's a lot of things, much more so than when I was young. And much more so than any other generation in, in the history of mankind. And, and so the temptations are out there. And, and so we have to be walking in a way that pleases our Heavenly Father. We are to walk in holiness. And then secondly, Paul says that we are to walk in love. Look again at verses 9 and 10. He says, Now concerning brotherly love, you have no need for anyone to write to you. For you yourselves have been taught by God to love one another. For that indeed is what you were doing to all the brothers throughout Macedonia. But we urge you, brothers, to do this more and more. You think about this. The transition from holiness... Uh, to love is not a difficult transi transition. They go hand in hand. And, and remember, we talked, uh, I think it was last week or week before last, we, talk about, we talked about Paul's prayer for them. In uh, uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 11 through 13, he talked about uh, you know, uh, praying that their love would grow, praying that their love for God and for others would grow. And uh, just as God's love is a holy love, so our love for God and our love for one another ought to motivate us to holy living. Um, one author, and this might have been Wearsby, the more we live like God, the more we will love. The more we live like God, the more we will love one another. In the Greek, um, for our word love, the first is the word eros, and it, and it refers to intimate love. Um, and we get our word erotic from this word. 
Uh, and it's not mentioned in the New Testament. Second word is, <clears throat> when I was learning these words, I would always forget this one. I could remember the three of them, but this one I never could remember. It's the word storge, and it's a, it's a family love, a love that you have for your children, you know, for, for family. Um, now, there's a, a word that's closely related, or a phrase, in Romans 12.10, brotherly affection. But this word is also not used in the New Testament. But the two words that are used in the New Testament, philia, uh, refers to the deep affection, uh, such as a uh, friendship, brotherly love. You know, Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. This word is used in the New Testament. And then the word agape. And we all know the word agape. It uh, refers to the love that God shows to us. And this love is, is not uh, simply a love based on feeling. It's, but rather, it, it's expressed in the will. Agape love treats others as God would treat them, regardless of our feelings and our personal preferences. It's the love that God shows to us and through us. And this is what Paul is saying, that we are to love not only God, but we are to love each other. And remember, Jesus talked about this uh, right, uh, right before he was uh, arrested and crucified. In John 13, 35, he said, By this, all men will know that you are my disciples, if you have love one for another. The same family and have the same father, we should love one another. And, and listen, God the Father taught us what love looks like by sending us his son Jesus. Jesus came and he gave up his life for ourselves. And so... 1 John 4.19 says this, We love because He first... Since Timothy reported the good news of their great love, Paul was encouraging them to love all the more. And he has this, like, an urgency. More and more as we see the day approaching, and we'll see more and more of a, a mindset in this kind of a thinking as we should love each other more and more. Our love for other believers should be evident in our lives. We're going to have different disagreements. We're, I mean, how boring would it be if we all just thought the same way and you know, never had a disagreement? But we need to learn how to disagree in, a, in an agreeable manner because the love of the Father is in us and through us and we should be loving we should be loving love. Amen? It's something you um, One author said this. Spiritual muscles are not exercised. The circulation is impaired. Meaning, the difficulties that we as believers, that we have with each other, we should learn to see them as opportunities to grow in our love. And we, I've talked about this before. Remember, we, I, I believe that God puts sandpaper people in our paths. And sandpaper, I was just using some sandpaper last night, and, and sandpaper does its job. I mean, I had a piece of wood, and it was rough, and I used a piece of sandpaper, and and I, I sanded and sanded. I made a mess, but I sanded. And man, when I was done, it was smooth. That's what God does with sandpaper people. He smooths out the rough edges in our lives. And we should learn to love one another because God has loved us. So we're to walk in holiness. We're to walk in love. And then finally, we're to walk in peace. Look at verses 11 through 12. And to aspire to live quietly and to mind your own affairs and to work with your hands as we instructed you so that you may walk properly before outsiders and be dependent on no one. Christians not only have the obligation to love one another, but we are also to be a good witness to the watching world. I've said this uh, over and over and over again. People are watching us. They know, if they know that we are Christians, man, they've got, the, they've got the magnifying glass out. They've got the binoculars, and they're watching to see in difficult situations. They're watching 
to see how we're acting. You know, it may seem like a paradoxical statement. If you're motivated to share your gospel, or to share the gospel, and I, I talk about it like this, if you're motivated to live your faith out loud, to tell others about Jesus Christ, this may seem crazy that he's saying to live a quiet life. Um, but the emphasis here is on quietness of mind and heart, the inner peace that enables a person uh, to be sufficient through faith in Christ. Uh, don't go around creating a bunch of problems as you earn your daily bread. That's really what Paul's talking about here. Live a, a quiet life. He was, you think about this, Paul was a tent maker by trade. And uh, he was careful, especially here in Thessalonica, um, he was careful to set a good example uh, of being a hard worker. Um, but unfortunately, some of the new believers in the church misunderstood the doctrine of Christ's return and gave up their jobs. We'll talk more about this later. But they, they didn't pay their bills, and they had, to have, they had to depend on other people to support them. And, and they were a poor witness in the community. And then he says that we are to mind our own business, mind our own affairs. Uh, and now this is Paul's way of saying, keep your nose. affairs. He would write in the second letter, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 11, For we hear that some among you walk in idleness, not busy at work, but busy bodies. So he's saying, stop and do what you're supposed to do. Honor God. We, if we're about the Father's business, we should not And again, with the advent of, you know, Facebook and the Internet and all of that stuff, it just. I just don't understand why people feel the need to post every. It just makes me nuts. I'm, I'm, maybe I'm just a, an old, uh, uh, what's Ron say? Maybe I'm just getting to be an old, but that makes me nuts. Why do they feel the need to do that? And then there, you get into Facebook wars. My daughter, my oldest daughter, is really bad at this. And I keep trying to help her with this. People will, will say something, and then they respond, and then they go back, and then pretty soon you got this Facebook. I said, here's the best way to handle it. When they say something, don't say anything. Don't respond. Say, God bless you, pray for you, let it go at that. Anyway, so we... <laughs> We should not be busy bodies, but we should be busy at work. And that's what Paul is telling the, this new church, these new believers. We must be careful to have contact without contamination. And this requires spiritual grace and wisdom. Paul says it this way in Colossians 4, 5. He says, uh, walk in wisdom toward outsiders, making the best use of the time. And he goes on to say, because the days are evil. And so if we lack this spirit of wisdom, we will do more harm than good. And so we are to walk a walk that pleases the Father. In order to do this, according to this passage here, we're to walk in holiness by specifically here by abstaining from sexual sin. We are to walk in love by loving each other. And we are to walk in peace by working and, and not meddling. And think about this. What the result of saved people see Christ magnified in our lives, in this kind of a life, they will maybe want to come to know who this Jesus is. Or maybe they will oppose it. But either way, we are to walk the walk that pleases our Father. Amen? Let's pray. Our Father, once again, we uh, bow before your throne. Father, thank you. Thank you for this time that you've given us. Help us, O oh God, as we have uh, read the instructions that you gave to Paul to give to this church and to us. Help us, Lord, to walk the walk that pleases you. Oh, Lord, we thank you for what you're doing. We ask, Lord, that you would continue to have your hand upon us. 
And God will be sure to give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen.